All praises to the Most High. So tonight's topic, we are continuing on the series, the seven stages of repentance, the seven stages of, of being born again. So today we're going to deal with the sixth stage of repentance, okay? Your family life. You must get your family life in order, okay? So we're going to go over that this day, all right? We're going to go over that this day. Let's open up. Let's open up with the book of Tobit, okay? You know what? Give, before you get me Tobit, give me Sarah 25 and 1. Ecclesiasticus 25 and verse 1. Let's read that. Of Ecclesiastes chapter 25, verse 1. Go ahead. In three things I was beautified and stood up beautiful both before God and men. Mm -hmm. The unity of brethren. Come on. The love of neighbors. Great. A man and a wife that agree together. You see that? It says the unity of brethren that goes into what? That goes into your social life. You understand? The love of neighbors that also goes into your social life, you understand, which affects your spiritual life, your health life, your work life, you understand, your financial life. It affects all of that. Okay. And then it says, and a man, a man and a wife that agree together. So now remember, we're dealing now we're dealing with your family life. Okay, so now as an individual. You've gone through all these stages. You are dealing with each one depending on where you are, where your areas of, of improvement are, where you need to pu put more focus on, where you need to emphasize on in terms of your life. You understand? So now, before you can deal with your family life, obviously, you need to prove. Because now you want to start a family. You understand? You've been dealing with all these stages. Now it's time for you to start a family. Watch this. You the, you the first thing that you need to understand is that before you prove a sister, before you prove a brother, you need to know what you want in a spouse. You need to have a standard. You know, before you can even think of proving, you must first know what do you want a wife for? What do you want a lord for? You need to know, you need to have the reasons why you need that. You understand? Now watch this. Give me the book of Tobit, okay? We must do things decently and in order. Give me Tobit 8, verse 5. Watch this. Tobit 8, verse 5. You have to have a standard, okay? Mm, you know what? Give me Isaiah. I know I'm jumping ahead, but let me just get it. Give me Isaiah 62, verse 10. Isaiah 62, verse 10. Read that for me. Isaiah 62, verse 10. The book of Isaiah. Chapter 62, verse 10. Come on. Go through. Go through the gates. Mm -hmm. Prepare ye the way of the people. Come on. Cast up, cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. What did the Bible say? Lift up a standard for the people. Lift up a standard for the people. Lift up a standard for the people. The standard is the Bible. You understand? The standard is the Bible. When you come into this truth, you cannot have a type, that same type that you used to have when you was in the world. You understand? You can't have that. You understand? You cannot have, you cannot be looking for the same type of women that you used to look for when you were in the world. You cannot look for the same type of men that you used to look for when you were in the world. When you come into the truth now, the most high God is going to give you a standard of what you look for in a spouse, what you look for in a Lord, what you look for in a wife, your rape. You understand? Read again. Verse 10. The book of, the book of Isaiah, chapter 62, verse 10. Come on. Go through. Go through the gates. Prepare ye the way of the people. Mm -hmm. Cast up. Cast up the highway. Gather out the stones. Lift up a standard for the people. Lift up a standard for the people. Lift up a standard for the people. That standard, give me that in Isaiah 13, verse 1 and 2. We are commanded to lift up a standard to the 12 tribes of Israel. So that when you come into the truth, you go through those five stages. When it's time for you now to say, you know what? I'm looking for a wife now. You know what? I need a Lord now. Guess what? You now understand what is the standard that the Lord has set for the 12 tribes of Israel. Read that. 
the book of Isaiah, chapter 13, verse 1. Read. The burden of Babylon, which mm -hmm. Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Come on. Lift thee up a banner upon the high mountain. Read. Exalt the voice unto them. Mm -hmm. Shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. So the Lord is saying we must lift up a banner upon the high mountain. The high mountain is Babylon the Great in verse 1. It says, exalt the voice unto them. The them is our people. You understand? It says, shake the hand, meaning correct our people. Give them the standard. Lift up the standard to them so that they understand the standard of living that the Most High God has ordained and sanctified for us. You understand? So now watch this. Give me Tobit 8 now, verse 5. Okay? Now that you want to start a family, you need to know what to look for in a wife. You need to know what to look for um, in, a, in a husband. Okay? A lord. You need to know that. Because otherwise, you coming into this truth, getting your mind right, you understand? Getting your health in order, you understand? Your social life, your social skills and so forth, your work life is in, is in proper order, your, your, financial, your financial health. Now you want to deal with the family. If you are confused about what, what to look for in a spouse, that means all those pillars were all for nothing. Think about it. That means you really have to apply yourself. You understand? Tobit 8 verse 5. Read that. The book of Tobit chapter 8 verse 5. Come on. Then began Tobias to say, Be mm -hmm. blessed art thou, O God of our fathers. Read. And blessed is thy holy and glorious name forever. Come on. Let the heavens bless thee and all thy creatures. Read. Thou madest Adam and gave us him Eve, his wife for an helper and stay. Come on. Of them came mankind. Thou hast said, it is not good that man should be alone. Pray. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. You see that thing? You see now Tobias is taking us back to where? To Genesis 2. Genesis 1, Genesis 2 particularly. You understand? Adam and Eve. They made the first marriage. You understand? The black family started with marriage. We need to understand that thing. We've lost that now that we are in captivity. We've lost that now that we are slaves. We are mentally destroyed as a people. But our nation started with a family. It's, our nation started with marriage. That's how it began. You understand? The first black power couple was a marriage. Adam and Eve. Okay? Read that again, verse 6. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 6. Read. Thou made us Adam and gave us him Eve, his wife, for an helper and stay. Come on. Of them came mankind. Read. Thou hast said, it is not good that man should be alone. Read. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. He says, let us make an aid like unto himself. So what, what is Tobias saying? Let us make him an aid like unto himself. Watch this. Give me the book of Sirach chapter 7. Okay, give me Sirach 7. Now read verse 26 for me. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 26. I'm going to show you what it means when it says, let us make him an aid like unto himself. Watch this. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 26. Read that. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Verse 26. Come on. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Mm -hmm. Forsake her not. Ray. But give not thyself over to a light woman. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Forsake her not. So this woman is after your mind. So guess what? She's going to be a reflection of your mind. That's what the Bible is saying right here. He says, do you have a wife after your mind? You see that part right there? She's after your mind. She knows, she'll be able to know the things that make you happy and the things that do not. Because her job is to glorify you. Our job is to glorify the Father which is in heaven. You understand? Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Christ glorifies the Most High. That's the order. So what we're reading here, it says, has thou a wife after thy mind? 
So, you know, in the world, they say happy wife, happy life. That's not in the Bible. You understand? Happy Lord, happy life. Why? Because read that verse again. Verse 26. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 26. Pray. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Come on. Forsake her not, mm -hmm. but give not thyself over to a light woman. So the Bible is saying, it says, if you have, you must, you must look for a wife that is after your mind. Okay. It says, when you find a woman like that, it says, don't forsake that sister. Then it says, but give not thyself over to a light woman. Meaning, don't give yourself over to a dumb sister. That's what the, that's what God is saying. He says, don't give yourself over to a simpleton, a simple sister. He said, don't do that. Because she's going to give you problems. That's what the Bible is saying right there. So let's go back to Tobit 8. Now, read verse 6 again. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 6. Thou made us Adam and gave us him Eve, his wife for an helper. And stay. Come on. Of them can mankind. Mm -hmm. Thou hast said, It is not good that man should be alone. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. You see that? The aid, meaning and help unto himself. A, a wife after his mind. You see that thing? A help meek. A help that is good for him. A help that is after his mind. You understand that? That, so when it says a man and a wife that agree together, the wife must agree with the husband, meaning what? Because the husband is the head of the house. So the wife must what? Must submit to her husband. That's what that means. And the husband must lead the wife according to what the Bible says. That's where you're going to have agreement in the house. The house will not be divided. But if the wife is going one direction, the man is going that other direction, the house will always be divided. Guess what? The kids will also be divided as well. And that's the type of life, that's the type of marriage they're also going to look for because they don't have the right example. Okay, read on, verse 7. Verse 7. And now, O oh Lord, I take not this my sister for last. That's the key right there. That's the standard. You see what, you see what the Bible is saying? This is, Tob this is Tobias speaking. It says, and now, O Lord, I take not this my sister for last. So that's the standard right there. You understand? You must have, you, you must have a standard. And it's not the standard of, it's your, of your own mind. No, how God laid it down for us. Read that again, verse 7. Tobias was in the full spirit here. Read that thing again. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 7. And now, O Lord, I take not this my sister for last. Mm -hmm. But uprightly. Go ahead. Therefore, mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. You see that? It says, I take not this my sister for last. So because if you take take the sister, because if you're looking for, for a wife, but you're only looking for somebody to have sex with, listen, that thing's not gonna last. You're not gonna, you're not taking, you, you don't, you're not looking for a wife. So you can become aged together. You understand? You know that marriage will not last. That's a, that's a recipe for disaster right there. It's not going to last. Read that thing again, verse 7. So we understand. If it's just for sex, because she's got big booty, big breast, she's a pretty face, that marriage is not going to last. Because what is she bringing to the table besides having a pretty face, having a big chest and a big booty and big curves? What else is she bringing to the table? Nothing. That marriage is not going to last. So if that's your standard, guess what? You're in the wrong place. You understand? That marriage is not going to last. Read that thing again, verse 7. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 7. Go ahead. And now, O oh Lord, I take mm -hmm. not this my sister for last, but Wait. uprightly. Therefore, therefore, mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. Remember, Tobias is praying. He's sending the prayers up. Watch the next verse in verse 8. Go ahead. And she said with him, Amen. You see what she said? This is the wife now. The wife said, he says, and she said with him, Amen. Meaning she agreed with the prayer that Tobias sent up to the, to the father. 
she agreed with that. You understand? So they were in full agreement because her mind was after Tobias's mind. That's why she agreed. Read verse 8 again. So we understand. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 8. And she said with him, Amen. Uh, read that again. I'm sorry. Read that again. The book of Tobit, chapter 8, verse 8. Go ahead. And she said with him, Amen. And she said with him, Amen. So the most high God has given us the standard. You understand? Don't take a sister for last. Don't take the, don't agree to be married to a man just because of how he looks on the outside. No. Obviously, there must be some attraction, but if that's the only thing you're looking for, guess what? That's not going to last. Watch this. Give me the book. Give me the book of Sirach 6, okay? Ecclesiastes 6, verse 7. Because now you're starting to, you're thinking about now, I want to start a family. You've got everything together. You understand? It's not perfect, but it's, it's manageable in a way that you'll be able to take care of a family. Okay, watch this. Sirach 6 and 7. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 7. Come on. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, mm -hmm. and be not hasty to credit him. Read that again, verse 7. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 6, verse 7. Mm -hmm. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first, and be not hasty to credit him. So when it says, if thou wouldest get a friend, the friend here goes into what? Goes into in terms of what? Getting a wife, getting a lord. You understand? That's the friend here. He says, if thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first and be not hasty to credit him. What is the Lord saying? The Mosai is saying, take your time. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Take your time. Don't be in a rush. And how, this is how you prove him or her. Watch this. Give me the book of 1 John 4 verse 1. 1 John 4 verse 1. If you were to get us, if you were, if you were to get a friend, you must prove them first. Don't be hasty to credit them. The reason why you see marriages don't last, you understand? Family gets broken up is because proving was not involved. You understand? So now that we come in Israel, guess what? We must learn the right way. We must learn anew. We must do things again from the way the Lord commanded us because we've not been doing it the right way. Okay? First John 4 verse 1. Read that. First book of John chapter 4 verse 1. Come on. Beloved, believe not every spirit, mm -hmm. but try the spirits whether they are of God. Great. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, believe not every spirit. Because guess what? A brother will tell you everything, whatever, it will tell you what you want to hear. A sister will tell you what they, what they think you want to hear. You understand? They are not going to keep it 100. So the scriptures is there to do, even if now that we was in the world, we used to lie, we used to speak evil, we used to just to get what we want. But now that we, can, we are in the truth now, guess what we must do now? We get our minds right. You understand? We keep the commandments, we apply, we examine ourselves. Guess what? The Lord is, is saying, you still got to prove them. You still have to prove them. Yes, they are in the truth with you. Yes, you, you hear good report of the brother. Yes, you hear good report of the sister. But you still need to prove them. Even though we say that's a good sister right there, that's a good brother right there, but you still need to prove the Negro. Because you still need to prove the brother because he just might still be in his Negro state of mind. He's just hiding it very well. She, you also need to prove the sister because guess what? Maybe she's an undercover feminist. You don't know. She hate the Bible. She hate men. You understand? But she's in the truth saying, I want the Lord. So the scripture says, you still need to prove them. Read that thing again. First book of John, chapter four, verse one. Mm -hmm. Beloved, believe not every spirit, Go ahead. but try the spirits whether they are of God. Right. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Meaning what? What is he saying? There's going to be lies that will be popping out. 
So your job is to do what? Your job is to prove them. So that means the sister must know, must know, must know the scripts. The brother, you need to study. You need to apply the scriptures. Because the only, the reason why you even know each other is because of what? It's because of the Bible. So when you prove, you are not using the Bible to prove, guess what? That marriage also will not be successful. Because the only reason why you know the brother in the first place is because the Bible is what brought you together. The Bible is the reason why you are in here. The Bible is the reason why you know the brother. You know the sister. So guess what? During the proving process, you have to open the book to prove the brother, to prove the sister, according to what that said the Lord. Watch this. Give me the book of Sirach 22, verse 19. Ecclesiasticus 22, verse 19. It says, if thou wouldest get a friend, prove them first, and don't be hasty to credit them. Read that. Sirach 22, verse 19. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 22, verse 19. Pray. He that pricketh the eye will make tears to fall. Come on. And he that pricketh the heart maketh it to show her knowledge. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, he that pricketh the eye will make tears to fall. Because you are irritating the eye. So the tears will come out in order to do what? To clean the eye. So it says, likewise, it says what? It says, so, and he that pricketh the heart maketh it, the it is the heart, to show her knowledge. The only way you're going to know what's in the man's mind, what's in the sister's mind, you must prick their mind. Meaning what? You must question them. You must prove them with the Bible. Then the Lord says, guess what's going to happen? It says, it will show her knowledge. So then you are proving them whether they are of God. That's what you're doing. You're proving to see their intent. You understand? Get that in Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Because the Bible is the only book that you're going to be able to receive the intents of the mind. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Watch this. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Read that. The book of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. Mm -hmm. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Pray piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Read. And of the joints and marrow. Mm -hmm. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You see that? So a lot of brothers and sisters, you overlook that part because you're looking at the fact that the brother is tall, he's dark, he's handsome and so forth. You're focusing on that. You understand? He's a pretty face. Is a yellow bone. That's your focus. Mm -mm. The Bible says you must use the scriptures to prove a brother. You use the scriptures to prove a sister. Because it says what? It says the word of God is a what? It says is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when you prick the mind, guess what? You're going to be able to know what? You're going to know their thoughts and their intent of do they actually want to get married because they want to grow all together? They want to build a family? They want to raise kids. You understand? They want to they, they, they wanna raise up their, their nation. They want to they wanna make marriage honorable, like the Lord says it is. You need to be able to investigate those things. The only way you're going to be able to pick up the intents and thoughts of the heart, you cannot use your own mind. You must use the scripts. That's the only way to pop that out. Watch this. Give me Sarah 27 verse 5. Ecclesiasticus chapter 27. Verse 5. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 27, verse 5. Wait. The furnace proveth the potter's vessels. Mm -hmm. So the trial of, a, of man is in his reasoning. You see that? The, the furnace that goes into the oven, the fire, is that it proves the potter's vessel because it needs to be put through the fire so it can be what? It can be hardened and so forth then you're going to know if the porter actually put together a good vessel because it was able to withstand the fire. Likewise, it says, so the child of man is in his reasoning. Because I get you are pricking the mind so that the knowledge can come out. You prick the mind with the word of God. That's what you're doing. Then it says, the child of a man is in his reasoning. 
Because if the brother is in the spirit, or if the sister is in the spirit, how are they going to reason? Get that in uh, Acts. Give me Acts 17 verse 2. This is how they're supposed to reason with you. You understand? They cannot be reasoning out of their own emotions. You understand? This is how they reason. Read that. Acts 17 verse 2. Read what you got. Acts chapter 17 verse 2. Go ahead. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What did he do? Reasoned with them out of the scriptures. So the apostle Paul, he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Not out of his own mind. Not out of his own emotions. Mm -mm. He reasoned with them out of the scriptures. Likewise, you see that part right there? Go back to Sarah 27. Sarah 27 verse 5 again. Okay. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 27, verse 5. Mm -hmm. The furnace proveth the potter's vessels. Right. So the trial of man is in his reasoning. You see that? The trial of man is in his reasoning. His reasoning capacity. Meaning what? How, how are we commanded to reason? We reason out of the scriptures. Excuse me. You reason out of the scriptures. You don't reason out of your own mind or emotions or how, how you feel. Mm -mm. Out of the scriptures. Meaning what? You use the examples in the Bible to see if this brother, does he, does he actually pattern himself after the righteous forefathers? Or he, it appears that he is but he's actually a black ashy demon. Likewise, the sister. Is she patterning herself after the righteous foremothers that came before us, that came before them? Or she's undercover Jezebel? How do you know? The only way for you to know that, you have to do what? You have to focus on, you have to prove. You must prove their mind. You understand? You must see where their mind is at. Is it on the Lord? Or is it on other things other than what the Bible says? Secondly, you must see, okay? Because we went over the pillars now. So by the time you get to say, I'm looking for a spouse, guess what? You have all these checks and balances to look for when you're looking for a spouse. Is their mind right? What it meaning what? Get 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. I'll give you an example with this. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5. Watch this. Read that. 2nd book of Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. Go ahead. Examine yourselves. Do what? Whether you be in the faith. What did the scripture say? Read that again. Second book of Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 5. Go ahead. Examine yourselves. Mm -hmm. Whether you be in the faith. The question is the, 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 the scripture is the scripture says, examine yourself. Meaning, do self examination. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith. So guess what? When you are doing self-examination, guess what? Because those are the things that you're going to check also. That's what you're going to prove. You you need to be able to see that, okay, if there's an issue, right? The issue arises. Are we going to go into the scriptures to resolve it? Or one of them, one of the people that are proving, they are going to be what? They are going to be defensive. They are going to be, um, they're going to make excuses for the, the stuff they do or they say how they act. You understand? So you need to, that's, where, that's the quickest way to see. This person does not want to examine themselves. That means if there's a problem, they are not going to admit. They're going to make excuses instead. So therefore, we're going to just be piling up problems and none of them are going to get resolved. So that's the first, that's the first red flag because they don't want to examine themselves. Because self-examination means what? You are, you, are, you are basically sitting down and being honest with yourself and say, what are the problems that I have that I deal with? What are the things that I struggle with that I need to fix? So by the time you get to your proving, guess what? You know that these are the things that you're dealing with and you have them under control with the word of God. She also does the same thing then you're not going to have problems. But if the problem arises, watch this. Give me Lamentations 3. Lamentations 3 verse 39. I'm going to show you something with this here. Because self lack of self-examination, that's the reason why we're at the bottom. 
Lack of self-examination, that's the reason why the 12 tribes of Israel is destroyed. We have broken family structures because of what? Lack of self-examination and lack of application of God's laws. Read that, Lamentations 3, verse 39. The book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 39. Go ahead. Wherefore doth a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. You see that? He says, wherefore doth a, li a living man complain? Meaning, what are you complaining for? Okay. A man for the punishment of his sins. Because when correction comes, you understand? When now you must take accountability and you complain, you make meaning what? You make excuses. We have a problem. That's the red flag right there. You understand? That is a red flag. That's why go back now to Sarah 27. Okay, verse 6 now. Read verse 5 again. Sarah 27, verse 5. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 27, verse 5. Come on. The furnace proveth the potter's vessel. Mm -hmm. So the child of man is in his reason. You see that? But guess what? Both of you must reason out of the scriptures. Because the first agreement that you have is you must agree on the word of God. You must agree on the, what the Bible says as it is written. Not how you feel, okay? No, based on what God says. Okay, we don't. The fruit declareth if the tree have been dressed. Mm -hmm. So is the utterance of a conceit in the heart of man. You see what he's saying? Because the, every, the fruit will tell you if the, if the, the tree is taken care of. If the tree is getting nutrients, the tree is getting fed, is being watered and so forth, the fruit will tell you. Likewise, it says, the utterance of a conceit in the heart of man. Meaning what? What's coming out of a man's mouth, what coming, what's coming out of a sister's mouth is going to be able to tell you what's in their mind. You understand? It will tell you that. Watch this. Keep reading. Come on. Praise no man before thou hearest him speak. Mm -hmm. For this is the trial of men. You see that? It says, don't praise any man before you hear, you hear them open their mouth. It says, because this is the trial of men. That's why I go back to Sirach 6 verse 7 again. Because he's saying the same thing. He's just using different words. Watch this. Come on. The book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 6 verse 7. If thou wouldest get a friend, prove him first mm -hmm. and be not hasty to credit him. You see that? That's the same thing we read in Sarah 27 verse 7. It says, don't praise no man before you hear them speak. So that goes into, as a brother, you're proving a sister. As a sister, you're proving a brother. It says, don't, meaning one, don't focus on the outward appearance. Get that in Sarah chapter 11. Verse 1. None of us too. So don't just focus on the outward appearance. You understand? Read that. Sirach 11 verse 2. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 2. Commend not a man for his beauty. Mm -hmm. Neither abhor a man for his outward appearance. You see that? It says don't commend a man because of his outward appearance. It says neither don't hate a brother or a sister because of what? because of their outward appearance. That's what the Lord is saying right there as well. Meaning, don't be shallow. That's what the Lord is saying. Keep it 100. Why? Because, because you are in the scripts, here's what you're going to think about when this comes up. Because you see the sister, you see the brother. I like the brother. I like the sister. Okay. Let's see if you're going to use the Bible to get your mind right, to stay focused. Because while you're proving, you can't be thinking about sex. Already right there, that's a recipe for disaster. Why? Because you're gonna have that anyway after once you once you get married, once you go into the marriage chamber, you're gonna do that anyway. So that's the last thing that should come to your mind. Sex is the last thing because you're gonna do that anyway in the marriage chamber after the marriage or during the wedding feast. You understand? So that's not supposed to be what's on your mind. Okay, watch this. Get that in, um, get Proverbs 31. Okay, give me Proverbs 31, verse 30. I love this verse right here. 
Okay, Proverbs 31, verse 30. The book of Proverbs, chapter 31, verse 30. Go ahead. Favor is deceitful, mm -hmm. and beauty is vain. Right. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. You see that thing right there? Yes, you're going to look. Obviously, there must be some kind of attraction. But guess what? If you're a spiritual man, you're a spiritual sister, yes, you're going to look at that. But you need to sit down with them and talk to them. Because it says, is what? The utterance of a conceit in the mind, in the heart of a man. The utterance of a conceit in the heart of a sister. But you need to sit down and talk to them. Yes, you're going to be, they're going to tell you, no, that's a good sister. That's a good brother. But you must sit down and prove. You must see it for yourself also. You must sit there and say, okay, I'm going to talk to the sister. Because she can be a good sister. You can be a good brother, but the, the problem could be that the two of you are not a good match. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She can be a good sister in the truth, all oh, praises to the Lord. You can be a good brother in the truth, but only to find that the two of you don't match. You understand? That, that can happen as well. But if you don't prove, guess what's going to happen? you're going to have problems because there's things that will pop up that you, you realize that if you knew, you wouldn't be, you, you, you actually wouldn't be in this mess. You understand? So now watch this. Get John 7, 24. The book of John, chapter 7, verse 24. Right. Judge not according to the appearance, mm -hmm. but judge righteous judgment. You see that? It says, don't judge according to the appearance. That's what we read in Sirach 11, verse 2. It says, don't judge according to appearance, what you see with your spirit, with your physical eyes. You must judge righteous judgment. How do you do that? You prove the spirit by the spirit. That's what the Lord is saying right there. Get that in Job 14. Okay. No, no, Job 10, verse 4. Job 10, verse 4. That's what I want. Job chapter 10, verse 4. Let's read that. The book of Job, chapter 10, verse 4. Wait. Hast thou eyes of flesh, or seest thou as men see it? You see what the Bible is asking? It says, hast thou eyes of flesh? Or seest thou as men seest? Meaning what? You are judging with your physical eyes, not with your spiritual eyes. Because your spiritual eyes will tell you, I need to sit down with them and what? And prove them. You understand? You must see where their mind is at. Now, one. Two, you need to be able to see, do they love themselves enough to eat well? You understand? Do they love themselves enough to what? To exercise? to take care of themselves, you understand? Because if they, if they don't want to make an effort to take care of themselves, there is no way in hell they will take care of you. You understand? So you have to be able to see that. So mean what? They care about their health, what they eat, how they eat, when they eat. They care about those things because you care about that. So because it's written in the Bible. So the two of you must agree on that. You understand? Then your social skills. Can, is there somebody you can conversate with? And so forth. You see that thing? Because when, when you grow older, that's all you're going to have left. Conversation. You understand? You will have, you, that's all you're going to have. Conversations and the life that you've been living and so forth. The mistakes that was made, you rectified with the laws of God the trials that the Lord brought into your marriage, so on and so forth. You understand? Because that's what you're going to have. Conversation when you grow older. So you better make sure that on a social level, you are able to what? To commune with the person and so forth. These are things you need to look out for. You understand? Their work life. Because their work life means that 
they'll be able to take care of the family once you start to have a family. You understand? The sister's not a lazy bum. The brother is not a bum as well. You understand? You have a, you have a, you have a, you have, you have, you have, you have only work ethic. You see that? So not only that, you need to be able to check, okay, you, are you financially healthy? Okay. These are things that you need to ask. So you going through the list. The list, the reason why the list is created is so that you can be able to what? You're going to use those different points to prove a brother and or a sister. Okay, that's going to help you. Watch this. Give me the book of Isaiah. Okay, give me Isaiah 11 verse 1. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11 verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Okay, I'm sorry, read that again. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 1. Right. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Mm -hmm. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. So now this is talking about Jesus the Christ. Go ahead. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Come on. The spirit of counsel and might. Mm -hmm. the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You see that? So let's talk about Christ. So now these are the, these are the characteristics that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has, which is the same characteristics that we must aspire to have and apply ourselves so that we can what? We can also, these, we can also use this, this standard that he uses in order to what? To prove, to make decisions. So you see that part right there? It says the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the law. Next verse, watch this. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And shall make him quick, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. Right. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. You see that thing? He says, He shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. He's not going to what? He's not going to use the physical uh, physical eyes to make judgments on the brother or sister that they are proving. So guess what? We mustn't do that. The Bible is telling you the standard. It says, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes because looks can deceive you. Looks can be deceiving because yes, they look beautiful on the outside, but they are a monster. So now, they are just, a, he, he or she is a beautiful monster. Watch this. Give me Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 8. You know what? Read verse 5. Watch this. Sirach 9, verse 5. Come on. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 5. Come on. Gaze not on a maid that thou, mm -hmm. that thou fall not by those things that are precious in her. You see that? Because when you are gazing, that means you're staring. So that's where your focus is on. Your focus is on the outward appearance. And guess what? Sisters know how to, they know how to do that. Sisters know how to do their thing. They decorate themselves out. They go all out to deck themselves. They smell good and so forth. But she's just a black ashy demon. And guess what? Sisters know how to pretend. They can keep that, they can keep that uh, facade they can wear that mask for long. You see that? They can put the mask for long. And then later on, guess what? The demon jumps out. You say, where the hell did that come from? That, that demon has been sitting there this whole time. Because when you were gazing on her and you fell by the things that are precious in her, you understand the curves, the big chest and so forth, the pretty face, you fell for that. Now you've got a dragon now, okay? Jump down to verse 8. Watch this. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 8. Come on. Turn away than I from a beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. And look not upon another's beauty. Right. For many have been deceived by the beauty of a woman. 
Go ahead. For herewith love is kindled as a fire. You hear what the Bible is saying? It says, turn away your eye from a beautiful woman. Meaning what? Stop gazing and lusting after her beauty. That's what the Bible is saying. Then it says, and look not upon another's beauty. Don't just be focusing on, no, she's beautiful, she's dead. You, they're simple as hell. That simple, that simple, that simple mode right there. You understand? Now you just entered the simp domain. So the Lord says, don't focus on that because many have been deceived by the beauty of a woman. So the Lord says, don't be deceived by the beauty of a woman. She looks beautiful. She's got big bumps, but she don't know how to cook. You understand? She don't know how to cook. She cannot clean. You understand? She's untidy. She don't know how to bath. She smells. She don't take care of herself. You understand? She doesn't bath twice a day and so forth. So guess what? She's looked beautiful on the outside, but guess what? She's untidy. One, two. She's unhygienic. She don't care about hygiene. You see that thing? So those type of things, you're not going to know those things if you don't prove. You must prove it. You understand? Here you are. You look at a brother. He's got big muscles and all that, but he's lazy. He's a bum. You understand? He doesn't want to work. So how are you going to take care of your family and so forth? They don't care about their nation. So how's that going to happen? You are, you have, you have a, you just have an overgrown baby. That's what you've got. You understand? So that's why the Lord says, don't look, don't focus on the outward appearance. Yes, the attraction is going to be there, but that's not your main focus. Your 99.9% 90, of your focus is going to be on what? The utterance of a conceit in the mind of a man. The utterance of a conceit in the mind of the sister. That's going to be your focus. That's what the most High God is teaching us right there. Watch this. Give me Proverbs 6, because this is a big one. Okay. The last of the eyes, ah, that's a big one in Israel. Watch this. Mm. Proverbs 6, verse 24. Because King Solomon, he explained this thing to us. Because remember, he had a thousand women. And all of them was dumb as hell. No one, all of them. In, listen, they were all dumb. That's what the, we read the Bible. The Bible tells you that. Okay, read that. Proverbs 6, verse 24. Of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 24. Go ahead. To keep thee from the evil woman, mm -hmm. from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, stay away from an evil woman. From the evil woman, this is how the evil woman uses her wives. It says, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Meaning what? She got game. This woman, this sister got game. She knows how to what? She knows how to make you feel like you're the best thing that has ever happened since sliced bread. Mm -mm. Don't listen to that stuff. You need to focus on what the Bible says. Because then you'll be able to what? To see the, you'll be able to discern the thoughts and the intentions of the mind. Next verse. Go ahead. Last not after her. The book of Proverbs chapter 6 verse 25. Come on. Last Come on. not after her beauty in thine heart. Mm -hmm. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, don't, it says, last not after her beauty in thy heart, meaning in your mind. Because if you are lasting after her beauty, this is what has happened. Get that in Judith. If you are lasting after her beauty, because that means last, that means you are thinking about this woman. You are thinking about that brother. You understand? All the time, something wrong. Why? Because you're still proving. You need to prove the sister first. You need to prove the Negro, the brother first, to see if there's a Negro in there or if it's a Jezebel sitting in there. You need to prove that. Get that in Judith chapter 16, verse 9. The minute you, you're lasting, guess what? This is where you are. Watch this. Sarag 6, I mean, Judith 16, verse 9. Read that. The book of Judith, chapter 16, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Her sandals ravished his eyes. Right. Her beauty took his mind prisoner. You see that? It says, her sandals 
ravished his eyes. Because who gets ravished by, by somebody's sandals? No. This Negro right here, he's got a foot fetish. That, that's the Negro right there. It says, her beauty took, it says what? Her beauty took his mind prisoner. That's when the lust comes in. Because a beauty now has taken hold of your mind and is, is holding it captive, prisoner, you gone. You're not gonna look at, you're not gonna see the red flags. You're not gonna see your, something wrong. This sister is beautiful, but she's crazy. This sister is beautiful, but she's a dragon. This sister is beautiful, but she's just Jezebel. You understand? She has no respect. She has got a big mouth. You see that thing? So because your mind is what? Has been taken prisoner by her beauty. You're just going to overlook all those red flags. You understand? That is going to what? Which are a recipe for disaster. That marriage will not last. It's not if or maybe. It's not going to work out. That's what, the, that's what the Lord is teaching us here. Read that thing again, verse 9. Go ahead. The book of Judith, chapter 16, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Her sandals ravished his eyes. Mm -hmm. Her beauty took his mind prisoner. Go ahead. And the fortune passed through his necks. The fortune is a blade. Okay. So, but what I'm showing you is when you are proving, it says prove them first, prove him or her first. Guess what? These are the things that you need to be mindful of. Go back to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6, verse 25 again. Come on. Proverbs 6, verse 25. Read that. Okay. So, Samuel, can you hear me? Okay. Brothers and sisters, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, is so Samuel still online? Yeah, I don't see it. Okay, maybe he's having network issues. Mm. Okay, just let's give him another maybe less than a minute. Let's see if he'll pop up. Okay. But I hope you brothers and sisters understand what's coming out here. Your focus cannot be on the windscreen. You can't be window shopping when you are proving a system. Because when you're window shopping, you don't, can't even fit the stuff. You're just shopping through the window. You can't touch it. You can only look at it. You look, but you don't touch. You understand? So we need to be mindful of that thing. The Lord, the Most High God has given us the blueprint on how to deal with this stuff. Okay, um, Soldier Nehemiah, I need you to pick it up. Read that. Proverbs 6, verse 25. Put some power in your reading. Yes, sir. Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 25. Read. Last not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. You see that? Is that don't let her take you by, by her eyelids, meaning what? The wanton eyes. You know, the, the way the sisters be looking at you, making those sexy eyes and so forth. That's what he's talking about when he says eyelids. They, be, they eyeball you. They look at you from top to bottom. They are sizing you up like a snake wanting to devour the prey. You see that? Next verse. Go ahead. For by means of the whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread mm -hmm. and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. So you need to investigate those things as well. Or is this woman just here because of what? She's hunting for the precious life. She, didn't, she don't care about family. She didn't care about the children that she will potentially have. She didn't care about her health. She didn't care about getting a mind right. You see that thing? She didn't care about her spirit if she can be able to commune and conversate and so forth, those type of things, she's not lazy with her hands. You understand? So those are things that you need to investigate. Don't be looking at the outward appearance. No, no, no. Yes, that will obviously, that's what you see. That's the first thing you see. 
But that's not the that's not that must not be the the thing that you live with. No, you sit down, you investigate, you do a diligent search. Okay, that's what it means to prove. Read. Go back to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter eleven, verse three again. Isaiah chapter eleven, verse three. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the mm. Lord God, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, Ray. neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. You see that it says neither is go is he going to reprove after the hearing of his ears. He is not going to just judge because of what he hears. No, he's going to investigate the matter to make a righteous judgment. So likewise, during the proving process, you must be a good listener. Let me say that again. During the proving process, you must be a good listener because when you are listening, you'll be able to pick up things that they actually not lining up with the scripts. But if you are talking the whole time, you'll miss a lot of stuff. That goes for both the man and the woman. You understand? So during the proving process, you must what? Let's get there. Give me the book of James real quick. When you're proving, because marriage is not a small thing. This is somebody that you're going to spend your life with. You're going to build a family with. This is somebody that is going to cook for you, as an example. This is somebody that is going to look after your children for you, as an example. So you really need to sit down and consider these things. What type of um, what type of person they are when it comes to the scripts? Are they patterning themselves according to this or not? You need to know that because if they are not, when problems arise, they're not going to go to the Bible. They're going to go to their emotions. They're going to go to their families in the world who are not married, who don't know nothing about married, who've never been married, and they're going to go and ad ask advice from them. You understand? Or ask advice from those that they had failed marriages. They never, they never got married even at all. They're going to go to those people in the world. You see that thing? So get, let's get that in James. Watch this. James chapter 1 and verse, verse 19. James 1 verse 19. Watch this. James chapter 1 verse 19. Come on. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to write. Uh -huh. You see that? It says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. During the proving process, listen, you must be able to, you, you, must, you must be a good listener. You must listen more and talk less. You understand? So that's what you, your job is to do there. If you're focusing on the booty, you're focusing on the on the muscle, guess what? That's not going to last because the Lord will tell you is his beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. A brother that um, has a good name, he's going to be praised for his good name. The good works that he's putting forth. Not because of his good looks. The most that God is giving us what we need to stay focused because marriage is a weighty matter. You understand? That's why it says prove. Let's go there in Sirach 7. Marriage is a weighty matter. Don't get it twisted. Okay? Sirach chapter 7, verse 25. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 25. Mm -hmm. Marry thy daughter, and so shall thou have performed a weighty matter. You see that? And so shall thou have performed a weighty matter. Marriage is a heavy matter. It's not, it's not something to play with. It's not, you have to really have gone through these steps that we are now, we are now putting, putting forth so you can be able to use that as an as a, as a, as a anchor for you to what? To say, okay, these are the things that are, these are the areas I need to work on before I can even think of saying, I want a wife. I want a Lord. Before you can even do that, you need to, you need to consider that. 
that marriage is a weighty matter. You understand? Now, go back to Sarak 6 and 7 now. Now that we understand, Sarak 6 and 7, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 7. Go ahead. If thou would get us the friend, prove him first and mm -hmm. be not hasty to credit him. You see that? Don't be hasty to credit them. And the reason why the Lord is saying, don't be hasty, like I mentioned before, the Lord says, be patient, give it time. So as you are proving, you know, say maybe a year, two years, you are proving with the sister for two years. That, that's enough. That's, I wouldn't say enough time, but it's, it's a good amount of time for, for to go through things while you are proving. You are testing scenarios. The most I will just make, you know, put some, uh, put some para paraffin in there to stir something up to see how does she behave when she's angry? How does he behave when he's angry? Those type of things. How do they deal with, with situations? How do they react? What do they use? Where, where is the first point? Where do they go first? Do they see counsel or do they just wing it? Do they go to the scriptures to see how it was done in the past so they can be able to make wise decisions? What do they do? You understand? But if you are hasty to credit them, you are not going to, you are, you are, you are not giving yourself an opportunity to, to see those things. You understand? That's why the Lord said what he's saying right there. Okay, watch this. Um, watch this. Give me, give me, let's deal with the man now. Okay. So he, here you are as a brother. You're looking for a wife. You are proving again. Remember, now we're dealing with family. Now you're considering, you know what? I need to now start a family. Before you do any of that, you've been getting yourself right. But guess what? If the bus doesn't stop there, now it's time for you to do what? You must prove a sister. So that's when you need to take your time. Don't be in a rush with this. Okay, get that in Proverbs 18, verse 22. Proverbs 18, verse 22. Read that. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and yeah. obtaineth favor of the Lord. You see what he's saying? He says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Because guess what? A, a, a wife like our foremother Judith, our foremother Sarah, you understand? Those type, our, 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 our foremother Suzanne, listen, those type of women they are not going to fall on your lap. Those type of sisters right there, you're, they are not going to fall on your lap. No. The Lord says, whoso findeth. That means this type of sister, you must look for. You have to look for this type of sister. You understand? Uh, and I, I know the mind of the Negro. He's thinking, sitting, you know what? So if I have to find her, which means if I, if, if I cannot find her in the camp, that means I can go to the world and bring her in. You simple as hell. Because I know that's how the black man thinks. That's how the black woman thinks. So we cannot think like that. You understand? Read that again, verse 22. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Guess what? That's a favor from the Lord. For you to find this type of woman right this 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 cause this is a virtuous woman right here for you to find a virtuous wife that's a favor from the most high god right there you better praise the lord your god once you find that type of sister because you must look for her you understand you have to look for that type of sister that's what the lord is teaching us okay and that takes what that takes patience it takes prayer it takes fasting, it takes counsel for you to be able to get to find your Sarah, to find your, your Judith, to find your Susanna, so on and so forth. You're not gonna be able, she's not gonna fall on your lap. Watch this. Give me the book of Proverbs 31 verse 10. Proverbs 31 verse 10. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. Go ahead. Who can find a virtuous woman? For mm -hmm. her price is far above rubies. 
You see what the Bible is asking? It's asking the same thing. Because we're in the same book. We read Proverbs 18. It says, who can find a virtuous woman? This woman, you have to seek her out. You understand? You have to pray for this type of woman. You must fast. You must get into consistent fasting. Pray to the Lord. Apply God's commandments. You must study. You understand? Because this is this type of woman, she's, a, she's going to be as a favor from the Lord. You see that? But if you are Speedy Gonzalez, you're going to get the gift of Satan. Read that thing again. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Come on. Who can find a virtuous woman? For uh -huh. her price is far above rubies. For her price is far above rubies. Meaning this type of sister. Get that in Sarah 26 and 1. Who can find a virtuous woman? Because you have to find her. Okay. That's why it says who can find it? You have to find it. You know what? Before you get there, before you get there, get it easiest ease. Because this is King Solomon. No, no. This is King Solomon's mother teaching him, the, giving him the characteristics of a virtuous wife. Because Bathsheba, she, find, she got her mind right. You understand? And she became this virtuous woman that we're reading about here. Now she's advising his son, her son on what to, what type, what, what does a virtuous woman look like? Now watch this. Um, get Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 27. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 27. Read. Behold, this have I found says the preacher, counting mm -hmm. one by one to find out the account. So King Solomon, with all these thousand women that he had, he says he counted them one by one. You understand? To find out the number. The number of what? Keep reading. Which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. Stop right there. So he says his soul was seeking for a virtuous wife. So he started to count and to count all the women that he was dealing with, a thousand of them, you understand? It says he could not find a virtuous woman among a thousand women. Really? One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. You see what he's saying? One man among a thousand have I found. The one man is talking about himself among a thousand women, it says, I have not yet found a virtuous woman among all these thousand women that I'm sleeping with, that I'm married to. You see that? So King Solomon, the wisest man on that walk the earth, he didn't find a virtuous woman. You better think about that. He was able to learn about a virtuous woman from his mother, because his mother, after she got her mind right, guess what? She what? She applied herself. She got her mind right. So now she's speaking from experience here. You understand? So if King Solomon, the wisest man, is telling you that, that says a lot. So when you say you're looking for a spouse, you're looking for a wife, listen. King Solomon said he even himself, he couldn't found, find a virtuous woman. So does it mean the virtuous women don't exist? No, 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 don't say that. The Lord is telling you that, listen, she's one in a thousand. She's one in a million. You see that thing? So now, let's go back to Sarah 26. Now give me Sarah 26 now, verse one. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 26, verse one. Right. Blessed is the man that has a virtuous wife, Mm -hmm. For the number of his days shall be doubled. You see that? The Lord, because remember, it says, you will find favor of the Lord. You will be blessed of the Most High. It says, a man that he finds a virtuous wife, he says, that man is blessed right there. That's the best brother is blessed if he can find a virtuous woman. And he says, the number of his days shall be doubled. Remember now, I want you men to think. It says, the number of his days are going to be doubled. Watch this thing right here. Give me the book of Matthew, okay? Give me Matthew 19. Let me show you something with this. 
He says, the number of his days shall be double. Let's see. Um, get that in Matthew chapter 19, read verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Come on. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? You see that thing? Him that made them at the beginning. So Christ is going back to Genesis 2. Go ahead. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That part right there. They twain shall be one flesh. They too shall be one flesh. So now go back to Sarah 26 and 1. I'm going to show you something with this verse right here. It says, they too shall be one flesh. Watch this. Read that. Ecclesiasticus chapter 26 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Blessed is the man that has a virtuous wife, for the number of his days shall be double. So now remember, it says, the two of you shall be one flesh. Bone of your bone, so on and so forth. Right? I'm just, I'm paraphrasing it. But it says, the, the days, the number of his days are going to be double to this man. So what is this telling you? This is telling us that, by the way, the Lord is teaching us that, okay, because you are one flesh, if you don't have a virtuous wife, your days are, are going to be what? Your days are going to be shortened on this earth because the two of you are one flesh. So if you have a dragon, you have a beautiful monster on your hands, your, the number of your days are going to be shortened. They are not going to be doubled because what she does affects you. Negative. What he does affects you. But here we're dealing with the system. If she's not this type of woman that the Lord is describing here, the sister with high moral standards, because that's what it means to be virtuous. Guess what? The number of your days are going to be shortened on this earth. So when you are proving, you brothers, you must think about that. Okay? You must think about that thing. Keep reading. Verse 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 2. A virtuous woman rejoices her husband, and he shall fulfill the years of his life in peace. You see that? Because she is a pillar of rest. She is not a pillar of salt. No, she is a pillar of rest. That's why it says he shall fulfill the years of his double life in peace. Because remember, it says the number of his days shall be double. So verse 2 is letting you know more benefits of finding this virtuous woman. It says the number, it says what? He shall fulfill the years of his life in peace. So if you have a dragon, you're not going to fulfill the, the years of your life in peace. You're going to die early because of what? You're going to stroke. Whatever the case may be, get that. Let me show you. Get that in Sirach 30. Okay. Sirach chapter 30, verse 21. No, no, verse 22. Sirach 31, Sirach 30, and verse 22. Watch this. Read that thing for me. Ecclesiastes chapter 30, verse 22. Mm -hmm. The gladness of the heart is the life of man. Right. And the joyfulness of a man prolongs his days. He says the joyfulness of a man prolongs his days. That's what we just read in Sirach 26. The joyful of a man because the virtuous woman, guess what? She is going to bring what? She's going to bring joy and gladness to her husband. He says, a virtuous woman rejoiceth her husband, and he shall fulfill the years of his life in peace. So that's what we read in here, right? Now watch this. Next verse. Verse 23. Love thine own soul and mm -hmm. comfort their heart. Remove sorrow far from thee. For sorrow has killed many. And there is no profit therein. But so what I want to show you here is this. It says, love your own soul. So when you are proving, you rush. Guess what? You don't love your own soul. You're proving a sister. You're proving a brother. You are rushing because you are horny. You are thirsty. You understand? You are a first bucket. Guess what's going to happen? It says, love thine own soul. When you're rushing, because the scripture says, be not hasty to credit him. Don't be hasty to credit it. The law says, 
Love your own soul and comfort your heart with the scriptures. Remove sorrow far from you. You see that? For sorrow hath killed many and there is no profit there. Why? Because you didn't take your time to look for this virtuous woman. You was rushing. So now you have sorrow of mind. Guess what? You're going to die young. The number of your days shall be shortened, not doubled. Okay? That's what the Lord is telling us right there. Keep reading. Verse 24. Envy and wrath shorten the life. Mm -hmm. And carefulness bringeth age before the time. Because if the two of you don't agree during the proving process, you don't agree what the Bible says, then what? That means there's the spirit of envy going on. There, you understand? Which will bring forth wrath, anger, bitterness. It says that's going to shorten your life. And carefulness, meaning stress, will bring your age before the time. The number of your days will be shortened. That's what the Lord is saying right there. So be very mindful, okay? Be very mindful of that thing. Now, go back to Sirach now 26. Okay, Sirach 26, verse 3. Read that. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 3. Mm -hmm. A good wife is a good portion, which shall be given in the portion of them that fear the Lord. You see that part right there? A good wife, that's a good portion. It says, we shall be given in the portion of them that fear the Lord. If you fear the Lord, you will receive this, this good portion. What will be the good portion? That virtuous woman. That virtuous woman will be your portion. Go back to Proverbs 18. Okay? Go back to Proverbs 18. Verse 22 again. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You see that? You'll obtain favor of the Lord. That's why he says, and he says, we shall be given in the portion of them that fear the Lord. Because that's a favor from the Mosai. That's favor from the, from the Mosai, his son, and the angels. Everybody's in agreement with that brother right there must be married to that sister, must marry that sister. That sister must be married to that brother right there. The most that God is approving it from the heavens, the Lord, the Christ is approving, the angels are in agreement. Guess what? You, the Lord will say, okay, give him that portion. Give him that gift, a virtuous wife. That's a gift from the Lord, understand that. That right there, she's a gift from the Lord. And a virtuous woman doesn't just pop out of nowhere. No, she must be built. A virtuous woman must be, must be put together by the leadership of the nation. We are, our job is to what? Is to, is to clean that sister who's got that Jezebel-minded that Jezebel sister. Our job is to clean her out and do what? And remove the filthiness out of her mind then. We begin to build her up and plant her in the spirit of Christ. Then we groom her to become that virtuous woman. And guess what? That thing takes time. It's not a two-year program. It's not a three-year program. It's not a four-year program. It takes time for that to take place. So that's why the Lord says, don't be hasty to credit them. Why? Because you need to take time. You understand? Watch this. Now, uh, go back to Proverbs 31. Okay, let's go back. Proverbs 31, read verse 10 again. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. He says, for her price is far above rubies. Meaning you cannot compare this sister with anything. She's priceless. That's the gift of the Lord. Why? Because guess what? You prayed for the sister. You fasted to get this type of woman. You apply, you seek counsel. You do the work of the Lord. You understand? Your mind is focused on God's laws. Guess what? That type of sister, she must be groomed. You as that, you as that alpha male, you also must be groomed. Don't get it twisted. I'm, gonna, I'm coming to that next. Watch this. Now, uh, Proverbs 31, read verse 11. 
Okay. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 11. Read. The heart of a husband that safely trust in her, mm -hmm. so that he shall have no need of spoil. You see that? It says the heart of a husband does safely trust in her. Meaning what? This woman right here, she knows how to take care of the, her law. She knows how to do that. It says the heart of a husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. Because if this woman, who, who, what is the spoil here? He's talking about another man spoiling or defiling this woman. You understand? If you instill God's commandments in her, you teach her, she applies and so forth and all, on, on all of that, guess what? There's no need for no, somebody else to come and spoil this woman. That's what the Lord is saying. You understand? So that's why it's important for you to do what? To prove. Next verse. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 12. Read. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. You see that? This woman is says she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. We're going to get some examples, okay? Watch this. Give me Judith 8, okay? Because now I'm going to show you something because we use our foremother, Judith, as an example, but I want to show you something deeper this day with this. Go, go to Judith now, 8 verse 1. Watch this. Judith 8 verse 1. I want you to see something here. Judith, chapter 8, verse 1. Come on. Now, at that time, Judith heard thereof, which was the daughter of Merari, the son of Ox, the son of Joseph, the son of Oziel, the son of Elshia, the son of Ananias, the son of Gedeon, the son of Raphaim, the son of Asito, the son of Eliu, the son of Eliab, the son of Nathaniel, the son of Samael, the son of Salasadai, the son of Israel. Go ahead. Now, here they are listing um, our former Judith, her fathers. Go ahead. And Manasseh was her husband mm -hmm. of a tribe and kindred who died in the barley harvest. So now Manasseh was Judith's husband. Manasseh was Judith's husband, right? Now I want I want you to just keep reading. Manasseh was Judith's husband. Keep that in mind. Keep reading. Go ahead. For as he stood overseeing them that bound sheaves in the field, the heat came upon his head, and he fell on his bed, and died in the city of Bethulia. And they buried him with his fathers in the field between Dosaim and Palamo. So now our forefather Manasseh, he died of a heat stroke. Okay. That's why it says, for as he stood overseeing them that bound sheaves in the field. Okay. The heat came upon his head. So heat stroke, right? Okay. So Manasseh, he was a businessman. You understand? He had multiple businesses and so forth. The proof of that is in verse 7. Read verse 7. Judith chapter 8, verse 7. Go ahead. She was also of a goodly countenance and very beautiful to behold. Mm -hmm. And the husband, Manasseh, had left her gold and silver and men servants and maid servants and cattle and lands. And she remained upon them. You see that part right there? It says, Manessa says her husband, she, he left a gold, silver, okay, men servants, maid servants, cattle, and lands. So Manessa had property all over the place, farms and so forth. So that's why in, in Judith 8, verse 3, read that, read that again. Judith 8, verse 3 again. Judith chapter 8, verse 3. Mm -hmm. For as he stood overseeing them that bound sheaves in the field. Stop right there. The he it says, as for as he stood overseeing. So he was an overseer because he was the, he was the owner of the company. The companies that he had. So he was, he was a what? He was a businessman. He was a man of the Lord. He took care of his family. 
He was an honorable forefather, Manassas. Understand? Because when he died, this is, these are the things that our foremother Judith inherited. You understand? Gold, silver, maid and men servants, cattle and lands. You understand? So now, watch this. Jump back down to verse 4. Read verse 4 now. Judith, chapter 8, verse 4. Uh -huh. So Judith was a widow in her house three years and four months. So now, uh, because Manessa's her husband died. Now she's a widow, right? Watch this. Give me the book of Serac 7. Serac chapter 7, verse 26. I'm going to show you something. Let's go back there, because we read it earlier. But I want to show you something. Our foremother, Judith, her husband died, okay? And he left her possessions. She was wealthy. Watch this. Now get Serac 7, 26. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 7, verse 26. Mm -hmm. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Forsake her not. Mm. But give not thyself over to a light woman. He says, do you have a wife after your mind? He says, forsake this woman. Forsake not this woman, meaning forsake her not. So now you need to sit down and think now, okay? Our foremother, Judith, she is now a widow, okay? Here the scripture says, do you, has thou a wife after thy mind? Because our foremother Judith's mind was what? Was a reflection of her husband Manasseh's mind. Watch this. Give me Sirach 6, verse 37. I'm going to show you the mindset of our forefather Manasseh because why? She was a reflection of him. I need you men to think now. She was a reflection of him, okay? Because we see by the way our foremother Judith was, we can tell the type of husband she had. The type of the type of forefather Manessas our forefather was, just by looking at the wife. You understand? Watch this. Now, where did I say go? Sirach six thirty seven, sir. Oh yes, read it. Come on. Ecclesiasticus chapter six verse thirty seven. Mm -hmm. Let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord. Go ahead. And meditate continually in his commandments. Mm -hmm. He shall establish thine heart and give thee wisdom at thine own desire. You see that thing? It says, let thy mind be upon the ordinances of the Lord. So the mind of the, the man's mind must be after Christ's mind. That's his focus. You understand? His focus is on what? Is on Christ. That's his focus. You understand? Watch this. Give me that in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Because the Apostle Paul, he taught about this thing. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Because his mind, the, our mind must be after the Lord's mind. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. Read. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You see that? He says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Because he followed Christ. He followed the lamb whithersoever he goeth. Get that in Revelation 14 verse 4 real quick. Revelation chapter 14 verse 4. Go ahead. These are they which were not defiled with women. Mm -hmm. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. You see that? These are they which follow the lamb wherever the lamb, whatever the Bible says, they are going to do it. No excuses whatsoever. That's why it says, these follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. So, now, remember what we read. Go back to Sirach 726. I'm going to show you this thing again. I need this thing to uh, to sink in the spirit. Sirach 7.26, read that. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 7, verse 26. Come on. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Forsake her not. But give not thyself over to a light woman. The reason why this is coming out is because Judith, our foremother, her mind was after our forefather Manasseh's mind. 
because the two shall be one flesh. But her mind was after her husband's mind. You understand? So she was a one, she was a complete reflection of her husband. Hmm. That's some heavy stuff right there. So Manessas was an alpha male. Think about that. Our forefather Manessas was an alpha male because you see how 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 well instructed the mind of our foremother Judith was. You see how disciplined she was because the the husband was like that. Our forefather Manessas was like that. So what we read, because we don't read, we don't really read much about our forefather Manessas, Judith's husband. But guess what? You can see by the wife that you see by the wife how the house was, how Manessas, how Manessas' house was. Manessas' house was in order. Understand that? Okay, watch this. Give me the book of Judith 12 verse 14. I'm going to give an example with this. I'm going to show you how in order that house was. That house was in complete order. And I'll show you this. We, I'll, I'll prove it with this. Watch this. Judith 12 verse 14. Read that. Judith chapter 12 verse 14. Come on. Then said Judith unto him, Who am I now that I should gainsay my Lord? Mm -hmm. Surely whatsoever pleases him, I will do speedily. And it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. Now, I want you to meditate on the scripture right here. It says, you see what she's asking? It says, who am I now that I should gainsay my Lord? Why is she asking that? She's asking that because she was in complete submission to Manassas. Because her mind was after his mind. That's why she's saying what he says she's saying here. Because what did our foremother Judith understood? She understood that if I go against my Lord, guess what? I will be an enemy into this house. I will be, I, I will be anti-revolutionary. I'm going to be counter-revolutionary. So our foremother Judith, she was a revolutionary sister. Understand that? She was a revolutionary sister, our foremother Judith. That's why she's saying, who am I now? that I should gainsay my Lord. Because if you gainsay your husband, that means the house is divided. That means you no longer, want, you no longer desire the, your, the mind of your husband. Your mind is no longer after your husband's mind. Now you're starting to follow Satan because that's what Satan does. He causes division. Our foremother Judith understood that. Okay, read again. Judith, chapter 12, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Then said Judith unto him, Who am I now that I should gainsay my Lord? Really? Surely whatsoever pleases him, I will do speedily. Mm. And it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. You see that thing? Is that surely whatsoever pleases him, I will do, I will do speedily. Because remember now, 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 hold on. Let's think now. Give me the book of Ephesians. I'm going to show you something here. Mm. Our foremother Judith, I'm showing you the, the type of the type of forefather Manessas was. So you brothers, you are looking for your Judith. You need to reflect back on how our forefather Manessas was, how he ran his house. He was an alpha. Okay, watch this. Get Ephesians, okay, chapter 5. Ephesians 5, read verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. You see what he's saying? That's the commandment. He says the wives must submit themselves. Submit. Submit yourself to your own husband as unto the Lord. Now, why is that important? Go back to Jude 12, 14. I want you men to understand this. Pay attention. Especially the sisters as well. I need you sisters to pay attention here. Okay, go back to Judith 12, verse 14. Judith, chapter 12, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Then said Judith unto him, Who am I now that I should gainsay my Lord? Surely, whatsoever pleases him, I will do speedily. And it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. 
Watch this. Give me the book of Ecclesiasticus. Let's go to Sirach real quick. Sirach 2. It says, whatsoever pleaseth him. It says, what? It says, whatsoever pleaseth him, I will do speedily. Hmm. Watch this. Don't forget what we read in, in Ephesians 5. Okay? Watch this. Um, give me Sirach 2 verse 16. Hmm. You know what? Let's start at verse 15. We're going to read 15 and 16 together. I'm going to show you something heavy with this thing right here. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15. Mm -hmm. They that fear the Lord will not disobey his word. And they that love him will keep his ways. You see that? It says, they that fear the Lord will not disobey his word. And they that love him will what? Will keep his ways. Remember, it says, wives, he says, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Because remember, she said, who am I now that I should gain say my Lord? Because Manessas, our foremother Judith understood that Manessas represented Christ in the house. I need you sisters to understand that thing. Manessas, our forefather, he represents Christ. He represents Christ in the house because we represent Christ in the house. Our foremother Judith understood that. And because she understood that, she understood what we're reading here. Read that again, Sarah 2.15. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 15. Mm -hmm. They that fear the Lord will not disobey his word. And they that love him will keep his ways. You see that? They will not disobey his word. Our foremother Judith did not gainsay her husband. She did not disobey her husband. She submitted herself to her husband. Next verse. Watch this. They that fear the Lord will seek that which is well pleasing unto him. You see that? It says, they that fear the Lord will what? Will seek that which is well pleasing unto him. Our foremother Judith, because she understood that the men represent Christ in the house, her husband, her Lord, Guess what? They that fear the Lord will seek that which is well-pleasing unto him. How did she know what was well-pleasing unto her husband, Manasseh? Because her mind was after his mind. That's why she knew what pleased him. So guess what she did? She did it speedily. She did not gain say. She did not twitch like a robot. She, he, she was not backing up against instruction. She didn't hate instruction because that is, that's why sisters they are afraid of the book of Judith. Why? Because Judith was on another level. She understood this stuff. Now we're making it plain. There's no more confusion with this now going forward. Okay, read that again, verse 16. Come on. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 16. Mm -hmm. They that fear the Lord will seek that which is well pleasing unto him. Go ahead. And they that love him shall be filled with the law, shall be filled with instruction shall be filled with instruction because Manasseh, he instructed his wife out of God's laws. So she was able, she submitted 100% to him. Why? Because she said it out of her own mouth. So now watch this. Go back to Ephesians 5 verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Go ahead. Wives, Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Meaning, just as you would submit to Christ, you must submit to your husband as and the same way because he represents Christ in the house. So our foremother Judith understood that. So you brothers, you're looking for Judith, you must move the way, the, you must move like our forefather Manasseh moved. You must move like that. You see that thing? So you sisters, you look at you, if your foremother Judith, you understand, you, you, you must pattern yourself after him. Guess what? That automatically what you're saying is you are looking for a Manassas. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I'm looking for a Manassas. You want to be a Judith? You are looking for a Manassas. That's what you're saying. Understand that thing. That's some heavy stuff right there. Keep reading. Verse 23, right? Ephesians. Chapter 5, verse 23. Mm -hmm. For the husband is the head of the wife, 
You see that? Even our foremother, hold on, our foremother Judith understood that, that the husband is the head, right? Even as Christ is the head of the church, right? And he is the savior of the body. Of the nation of Israel, because he died for us, right? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, mm -hmm. so let the wives be, be to their own husbands in everything. You see that part right there? It says, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, the 12 tribes of Israel, we are subject unto Christ. We are his subjects. He is our Lord. It says, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What's the example? Go back to Judith 12 verse 14. I want this verse to marinate in the mind of the sisters. I want this verse to marinate in the mind of the brothers because now you need to what? Now you, you start to see the type of man our forefather Manasseh was. Read that. Judith 12 verse 14. Read. Judith chapter 12 verse 14. Come on. Then said Judith unto him, Who mm -hmm. am I now that I should gain say my Lord? Come on. Surely. Whatsoever pleases him, I will do speedily, mm. and it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. It shall be my joy. It shall be my joy unto the day of my death. Remember what she understood. Give me the book of Tobit real quick. It says, it shall be her joy unto the day of her death. Why? Because here's what she understood. Give me Tobit 8 verse 7. Hmm. Heavy stuff. Tobit, chapter 8, verse 7. Come on. And now, O Lord, I take not this my sister for lust, but uprightly. Mm -hmm. Therefore, mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. That's what she understood. Mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. Read the next verse, verse 8. And she said with him, Amen. Meaning, I'm in agreement, my Lord. And that's our foremother, Judith. She was in complete agreement with her husband because it says, he said, mercifully ordained that we may become aged together. Go back to Judith 12, verse 14. Judith, chapter 12, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Then said Judith unto him, who am I now that I should gain say my Lord? Mm -hmm. Surely whatsoever pleases him, I will do speedily. And it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. So now you see what that part right there when it says, whatsoever pleaseth my Lord, that's what we read in Sarah 2 verse 16. It says, they that, love, they that fear the Lord will seek that which is well pleasing unto him. Because our foremother Judith, you know what she did? She was, she, she was seeking that which was well pleasing unto her Lord, which is who? Her husband, Manasseh. You see that thing? So that's why he says, whatever pleases my Lord, I'm going to do it speedily. Why? Because she understood he represented Christ in the house. Guess what? It says, and it shall be my job. So the sister, she didn't look at marriage as a slave contract, like the black woman does this day. You see how, how, how low we have fallen as a people. Today, the black woman look, looks at marriage as a slave contract. That's simple as hell. That's dumb as hell. Because look at the honor that comes with you being submissive to your husband. And it also tells you what the type of husband you've got. He's a man of honor. Because this says, it shall be my joy unto the day of my death. Now, I want to deal with that speedily part. You see that part right there when it says speedily? Watch this. Give me Sarah 5 verse 7. Now, this is this goes into the Mosai, Christ and the Mosai. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Make no tarrying to tend to the Lord. Right. And put not off from day to day. Do, do, is it do what? And put not off from day to day. And put not off from day to day. Meaning what? You don't be postponing it no, no, tomorrow, tomorrow. Mm -mm. It says put not off from day to day. Make no tarrying to tend to the Lord. Meaning don't waste time. Move with the spirit of haste, speedily, like we read in the book of Judith 12. When we, when we deal with the Mosai, we have to have that level of agency because 
our foremother Judith, when she dealt with her husband also, guess what she did? She, she what? She, was, she moved with the spirit of haste to please him speedily. I'm showing you the parallels here. Okay. Read that thing again, verse 7. Hmm. Heavy stuff. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 7. Come on. Make no tarrying to turn to the Lord hmm. and put not off from day to day. Okay. For suddenly shall the wrath of the Lord come forth, and in thy security thou shalt be destroyed and perish in the day of vengeance. You see that? Because guess what? Imagine her, her husband dies. He has got all this wealth, this wealth and so forth. And she was a black ashy demon. You think she was going to get all this wealth? No, she wasn't. Likewise, if we don't keep God's commandment as men, we don't move with the spirit of haste, you think we're going to get the kingdom? No, we are not going to get it. I'm trying to show you how serious this is. This is heavy stuff. This is serious business going on. Understand that thing. Okay. Now, watch this. Now give me Sarah 26 verse 13. We're still dealing with our former the Judith because you brothers, you're looking for Judith. You sisters want to be a Judith. Guess what? This is twofold. I'm hitting two bases with one stone. You want to be a Judith? Guess what? You are automatically saying, that's the type of, of, of a Lord I'm looking for. You understand? If you want to be a Judith. You are looking for a Judith, you are automatically saying, this is the type of man I want to be like, our forefather Manassas. That's what you're saying. By default, that's what you're saying. Get Sarah 26 verse 13. Watch this. Ecclesiastes chapter 26 verse 13. Mm -hmm. The grace of a wife delighted her husband mm -hmm. and her discretion will fatten his bones. You see that thing? So her discretion fattened his bone because she was she was she had high moral standards. She was a virtuous woman. Our foremother Judith was a virtuous woman. Understand that. Go ahead. A silent and loving woman is the gift of the Lord. You see that that's the, that was Manessa's portion. Judith, our foremother, she was that silent and loving woman. She was the gift. She was that she became. The reason why it says is a gift of the Lord is because our foremother Judith was a virtuous woman. Because her mind was well instructed. Her mind was well instructed. She was she had wisdom. She applied herself. That means she came from a good family. Her father and mother taught her God's laws. You need to understand that because she came from a good family from a young age. She came from a good family. So that's letting you know that her parents was righteous. They taught her the law of Moses, just like they taught Susanna the law of Moses. And that's why she was married to Joachim. Hmm. Read that thing again, verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 14. Go ahead. A silent and loving woman is a gift of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing so much worth as a mind well instructed. You see that? Judith's mind was well instructed by her husband, Manassas. Okay, come on. A shamefaced and faithful woman is a double grace. Mm. And her continent mind cannot be valued. Meaning what? Her price is far above rubies, like we read in Proverbs 31, verse 11, verse 10. Read. As the sun, when it arises in the high heaven, so is the beauty of a good wife in the ordering of a house. So Judith had all these proper hairs, or had all these qualities right here. She pleased her husband Manessas all the days of her life while Manessas was still alive. Even after he, he was gone, she still had a good name after the fact. Because what? Her mind was well instructed by her husband Manessas. Manessas was an alpha male. He followed after the footsteps of our forefather Abraham. You understand? He commanded his house. Next verse. Watch this. As the clear light is upon the holy candlestick, mm -hmm. the so, is the, Ray? so is the beauty of the face in ripe age. In ripe age. In ripe age. Read that verse again. Verse 17. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 17. Go ahead. As the clear light is upon the holy candlestick, mm -hmm. so is the beauty of the face in ripe age. It says, so is the beauty of the face in ripe age, meaning what? So remember, it says, don't judge with the what with the side of your eyes. But it says, so is the beauty of the face in ripe age. Meaning what? She aged. She aged well. Even when she was older, she was still beautiful. She still looked young. Her skin was still smooth and so on and so forth. Why? Because she was a virtuous woman. She understood where to find the best food and so forth. What type of food to eat in order to have good and beautiful skin. Hygiene. She understood all of that. Don't get it twisted. That's why he says, so is the beauty of the face in ripe age, meaning old age. She was still looking, she was still bare to the bone. Okay, now watch this. Give me. Hmm. Let me see something. Watch this. Now let's go back. Go back to Judith 12. Okay, go back to Judith 12. So what I'm, what I'm going to show you here is our foremother Judith, she was what? Remember, you know what? Give me, give me, give me Genesis. Let me show you something. We read it, we read it in Matthew, but let's go to Genesis 2. Get Genesis, the second chapter, okay? Genesis chapter 2 and verse... Genesis 2.24, read that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Go ahead. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they shall be one flesh. So Judith, our foremother, Manasseh, our forefather, they were one flesh. The reason why there were one flesh was because our foremother Judith, Sirach 726, read that again. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 26. Go ahead. Hast thou a wife after thy mind? Forsake mm. her not. Wait. But give not thyself over to a light woman. You see that? Our foremother Judith. Her mind was after our forefather Manasseh's mind. That's why it says, forsaken not. It says, but give not thyself over to a light woman. Because a light woman, her mind, she's not going to pattern her mind after your mind. She's, a, a dumb woman is not going to do that. A dumb woman is a weak woman. She's not going to follow you. She's going to try to do her own thing. That's a, she's a liability. That type of sister... She's weak, my that's a weak woman right there. So our foremother Judith wasn't like that. She understood that there's power in submission. She understood that thing. That's why even her name this day, we still talk about our foremother Judith. You understand? And she was a complete reflection of him, how he was, our forefather Manasseh. So when you read the book of Judith, you really have to see that type of husband Manessa's her husband was. It tells you a complete picture of how he was. He was an alpha. You understand? He was. Now watch this. Now, let me switch gears now. Let me deal with the sisters. Sisters saying, I'm looking for Abraham. So you must, you must think now. I dealt with, I, I dealt with two bears with one stone, but I just want to touch on this. Give me the book of Genesis 18, verse 18. Sisters say, I'm looking for Abraham. Okay. Because you will have sisters that say they claim they are looking for Abraham, but they are, in fact, in reality, they are looking for Ahab. Oh, yes. Yes. There are some sisters that say, I'm looking for an Abraham, but she's actually looking for an Ahab. So what is she? She's a Jezebel. You understand? Who like to rule over men? They like to speak over men. They like to be telling men what to do. That's a Jezebel right there. That's not, an, that's not a virtuous woman. No, no, no. That's a dragon. 
You stay away from that type of system. Watch this. Now, Genesis 18, verse 18. Read what you got. Genesis chapter 18, verse 18. Go ahead. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, mm -hmm. and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Go ahead. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, mm -hmm. and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Because of what? He promised Abraham, the Lord promised Abraham that I'm going to give you a child. Now, watch this. You see that part, he says, he will command his, his children and his household after him. So we read this all the time. You can go to other classes to get some more details on these. But here's what I want to show you with this. Give me Genesis 22 verse 1. I'm going to show you something. I want to show you the mindset of our forefather Abraham. Because remember, it took them years to find, I mean, he, he, a Ishmael, when, when, when Ishmael was conceived, our forefather Abraham was, was 86 years old. You understand? He was 86 years old. So when, 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 when Abraham was 99 years old, when he was 100 years old, Guess what? That's when our foremother Sarah conceived our forefather Isaac. You understand? So it's been many years without children. Think about that. You understand? So much so that out of desperation, the, our foremother in Genesis 16 said, you know what? Deal with this. Um, um, let Hagar, our handmaid, be a surrogate so that we can get children by her, so I can get children by her. You see that thing? Now watch this. Get Genesis 22 verse 1. Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. So now it says, God did tempt Abraham. Okay, but Mm. Get that in James real quick. James 1. Let's get James chapter 1. Because you might think that's a contradiction. Um, get James chapter 1 verse 13. James chapter 1 verse 13. Mm -hmm. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. You see that? It sounds like a contradiction. Go back to Genesis 22 now. Read verse 1 again. Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now jump down to verse 11. Let's see if it's God that is speaking to Abraham or not. Because it says, the Lord doesn't tempt anybody. Yes, says God tempted, tempted Abraham. Read verse 11 so we understand. Genesis chapter 22, verse 11. Mm -hmm. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham. Abraham, and he said, here am I. Go ahead. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. So now, you see now, verse 1 says um, that God did tempt Abraham. Verse 11 says, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. So verse one is not the most like God. He's letting you know what verse one is making reference to. He's explaining in verse 11 is what the angel of the Lord. It wasn't the most like God. Get that in 2nd Ezra 7 verse 1. 
second is a seven plus one we did second Ezra chapter seven verse one mm -hmm. and when I had made an end of speaking these words there was sent unto me the angel which had been sent unto me the night afore. So now this is Uriel the angel uh, speaking with Ezra about many things, many issues that he was having questions about. Read. And he said unto me, Up, Ezra, and hear the words that I am come to tell thee. Read. And I said, Speak on, my God. What did he say? Speak on, my God. He says, and I said, speak on, my God. You see with the capital G? It's the same thing that we read in Genesis 22, verse 1. The Genesis 22, verse 1 in 11 is not talking about the most High God, the angel. You understand? That's why it says in James, the apostle James says, God doesn't tempt anyone. Now let's go back to Genesis 22 now. Genesis 22, verse 1 again. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now, at this point, the Lord, uh, the Lord, meaning the angel, is instructing Abraham on what needs to happen. Meaning what? You are going to sacrifice your only son, Isaac. Go ahead. Jump down to verse 11. Let's just get to the point. Verse 11, again. Genesis chapter 22, verse 11. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. Mm -hmm. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know thou fearest. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Jump down to verse 15. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15. Go ahead. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time mm -hmm. and said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. So now what I want to show you here is that it took years for our forefather, our forefather Abraham and our foremother um, Sarah to get a child that was promised by the Mosai. So now after many years, you understand, now they are a hundred years old. When they, when they got it, the Isaac was born when Abraham, our forefather was a hundred years old. So now watch this. You can imagine, I mean, it's a hundred years without a child that was promised by the Lord. So you can imagine that, you understand? It takes a toll on the mind also. You understand? Watch this. Give me Genesis 17 verse 19. Genesis chapter 17 verse 19. Come on. And God said, Sarah thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now with his seed after him. Now jump up. Read verse 17. Watch this. Genesis chapter 17, verse 17. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? That is a what? And shall that is a hundred years old? You see what he's asking the Lord is a, shall a child be born unto me? The me that is a hundred years old. I'm hundred years old. Go ahead. And shall Sarah, that is 90, 90 years old, bear? You see that? So there were there, there were there were a 10 year gap difference, age difference. Sarah, our foremother, was 90 years old. Our forefather, Abraham, was 100 years old. Watch this. Genesis 18, verse 12 now. Watch this. Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. 
Mm -hmm. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? You see that? My Lord being old also? So guess what? They understood. Listen, we old. We are not going to get children at this age. Watch this. Give me Romans. Give me Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, verse 11. Hebrews 11 and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. Come on. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. You see that? It says through faith. It's just because through faith, it says also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Remember, I mean, they struggled many, many years for a child, okay? And because of the promise that was given unto them that they were going to receive a child, obviously, over time, that when it didn't happen at the time they thought, you understand? I mean, it took a toll on them, but they had faith. At, the, 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 at some point, they had faith. Of like, you know what? It's going to happen that we will conceive because the angels came when they visited our forefather Abraham. He made them food and so forth. Now, listen, next year, on the, uh, around this time, you're going, to have, you're going to have a child. Sarah is going to conceive. You see that? Go ahead. And was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she just that? faithful. She says, she says what? And was delivered of a child when she was past age. Meaning what? The biological clock has run out, so to speak. You see that? But it says through faith, guess what? She was able to conceive. Go ahead. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. Because we read it in Genesis 18. Go ahead. Therefore, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. And him as what? And him as good as dead. He says, therefore, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. Meaning, our, it says, our forefather Abraham was like as good as dead. He's like, you see how old I am? Hey, that is this. I'm going to get a child at this age. Go ahead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand, which is by the seashore, innumerable. Okay, jump down to verse 17. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Mm -hmm. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. So now, I want you to think right here, right? It says, read that part again. Hmm. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, I want you to, I want you to think. Now, you sisters, you say you're looking for Abraham. Can you imagine? I mean, it took a toll on them. Yes, they had faith because the Lord, you know, also gave them a sign towards the end. But what I want to show you is that imagine you're looking for, you, you're desperate for a child, and then the Lord finally blesses you with a child. Soon after that, the Lord says, okay, go up there and sacrifice your only son. So what do you think is going on in the house with us between the husband and wife on the, at this point? What do you think is going on? You think there's no fight? You think there's no disagreement? You think there's no, what the hell? I mean, you, you know how long it took for us to get, actually get this child? Look how old we are. You're gonna take the, the only child you're gonna sacrifice, that child, our forefather Abraham did that thing. He was willing to sacrifice his only son that it took so many years for him to even get to have a child like that, the one that was promised by the Lord. Abraham, when, when he was told, go and sacrifice your only son, he didn't twitch. He didn't say, mm, but I mean, you know, Lord, you know, it took so long. Mm -mm, he just did it. He didn't make excuses. He just got it done. 
when he was about to do it, the Lord said, okay, stop. Now I can see or you believe me, you are faithful to. So you sisters, you say you're looking for Abraham. Abraham, say he was, he was um, commanded to sacrifice his only son and he went out there and do it, to do it. Although the Lord stopped him, but he went out there with the intentions to do it because that's what the Lord told him to do. So if you say you're looking for Abraham, understand, that's the type of man, that's the type of Lord you say you want. By default, that's what you say. By default, you say you're looking for Abraham and Abraham is willing to do that type of a thing for the Lord because he believes that much in the Mosai. Your mind has to be after his mind. And I'm going to show you the mind of our forefather Abraham right here. Jump down to verse 19. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Go ahead. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Yeah, you see that? The reason why he went out there to do it is as he accounted that the Mosai was going to raise this child up from the dead. So, but sisters won't believe that stuff. Imagine that's what's going on. Now you're telling me your wife, you say, listen, we have to go and sacrifice this case that we've got. Listen, before you finish that statement, the police will be at your door. Think about that thing. You understand? The police will be at your door about that thing. Say what? Yes. But read that again, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19. Mm -hmm. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. You see that? So now what I'm showing you here is that our forefather Abraham, he had great faith. You understand? So guess what? As a sister, you say you're looking for Abraham. That's what you say. That's the type of Lord you're looking for. You're looking for that type of brother. The most High God, he deals with standard. You understand? That's what you're saying. I'm looking for that type of brother. Okay? Because guess what? Watch this. Get Hebrews 11 verse 3. Hmm. Read verse 1, then we're going to jump. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Go ahead. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, mm -hmm. the evidence of things not seen. You see that? Because you have faith. Let's say, let's say, let's say you get married, you can't have kids. Now your marriage is tested, is tested from, from the jump. You get married. Now you cannot conceive. You can't have, you're trying to get pregnant. Nothing is happening. Guess what? That's your trial. So now you have to seek counsel and say, okay, what needs to happen? We go into the scriptures, you change your diet. Your diet must change and so forth. Guess what? You have to have the faith that the, 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 the medicines that the Lord created out of the earth, your diet, that means, 12 months straight, you must, you must be on that diet. On a, you must be strictly on the diet. No excuses, no nothing. Why? Because you want a child. You want to get your, your home, you, you want to get your, your pH to be balanced. You understand? In your, in, your, in your vagina and so forth. You want your ovaries to be on point in terms of uh, the pH levels and so forth. You want, because that thing takes time. It's not, an, it's not a three months program. No, 12 months plus where you have to be on a strict diet, fruits, veggies, exercise, water, all of that, sleep. You listen, you must, you have to do that consistently. That means you have a, you must have a good timetable. Guess what? You are given that cancer. This is what you must do. You must follow this timetable right here. This is the type of food you must eat every day for the next 12 months. Guess what? The, the your Lord will say, I have faith in this. You, on the other hand, might not have that. You might not have that type of faith. Because you see, I'm looking for Abraham. You say, okay, I'm going to show you the type. The, you see, you're looking for Abraham? No problem. Now you cannot conceive. Guess what? He, now you get a program, you get a counsel. This is what you must do. Your Lord has faith on it. 
then you must now do the follow the 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 the, the timetable and the diet plan. You decide, you know what? Me, I'm craving this, I'm craving that. You mess up with your diet, you don't tell your Lord. You see how messed up this can be? So if you say you are looking for Abraham, you have to have that you have to now start to investigate the type of faith that he had, the type of seriousness that he had when it came to the laws of the Mosai. No excuses. That's, that's the type of Lord you say you want. Read verse 3 now. Come on. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Mm -hmm. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Come on. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Because we didn't see the Lord create all this. Jump down to verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Mm -hmm. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. You see that? Without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Because faith, your faith will be shown by your works. Go ahead. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, mm -hmm. and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must diligently seek after the Lord. The same way our foremother, Judith, diligently seek after what, what is well-pleasing unto her Lord. Likewise, we must seek diligently that which is well-pleasing unto the Lord. That's the order right there. So you looking for, you you go, went through all those stages of repentance. Now it's time for you to say, you know what? I want to build a family. If given that's the case, everything that we just went over, that's what must be on, in your mind. You men understand that? Yes, sir. Sisters, do you understand that? Yes, sir. All praises to the most high. Now give me First Corinthians 7, 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. Come on. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Mm -hmm. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Really? Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. You see what the apostle Paul is saying? It says, but such shall have trouble in the flesh. You must understand, you're going to have problems in your marriage. So you must prepare yourself for that. That's why proving is important. That's why seeking counsel is important. Why? Because you are preparing yourself for what's coming. That's what the Lord is saying. He says, you're going to have trouble in the flesh. You understand? You're going to have those problems. But the way you solve them, because you agree you are one flesh, Guess what? You have to go to the scriptures to solve those problems. Get that in Sarah 2 verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. Mm -hmm. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. You see that? You come to serve the Lord. Meaning what? You come to serve the Lord, you say, okay. I want to get my mind right. Eventually, I want to get married. Guess what? The Lord is saying, whether you come in as an individual, you are going to, you must prepare for temptation. Whether you say, now I want to get married, you must prepare for temptation. Now you're going to be among the congregation, you must prepare for temptation because you are going to be tempted on all those levels. Next verse. Go ahead. Set thy heart aright mm -hmm. and constantly endure. You see that? And make it says const constantly endure because this type of race requires endurance. You cannot endure if you're not in the fight. Endurance requires you to be actively involved in the fight to test and see your endurance level. Go ahead. And make not haste in time of trouble. Don't run in time of trouble. You understand? He's going to tell you what you must do. Next verse, read. Cleave unto him. And depart not away, that mm -hmm. thou mayest be increased at thy last end. You see that thing? So when it says, make not haste in time of trouble, he's giving you the solution in verse 3. It says, cleave unto him and depart not away. Meaning, hold on to the Lord. Hang on to the most High God. It says that so that you may be increased in the last end when we receive the kingdom. Next verse. Go ahead. 
whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully mm -hmm. and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. You see that thing? Don't make no haste. Don't make, don't make haste in time of trouble. That's why it says, and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate, when the trouble comes, when the trial comes, when the trouble in the flesh is going to hit you. The Lord says, you must be patient. Because what is he teaching us? He's teaching us patience. The Lord is teaching, these trials are there to teach us to what to have patience. Give me that in James 1, okay? These trials are there for what? To teach us patience. Give me that in James chapter 1 and verse 3. Read that. James chapter 1 verse 3. Mm -hmm. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So now when you are going through a trial, because the trial is to try your what? Your faith. That's what we read in Hebrews 11. Our forefathers, their faith was tried and the way they overcame. He says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, because that's what's going to be tried, your faith in this book. He says, it worketh patience because you, you get tried. You might not be able to overcome the first time, but you might be overcome. But guess what? You get up, you learn from your mistake. The next time when the same trial comes, now you are built better. You know how to respond. Guess what? That takes patience for you to overcome. Next verse. Go ahead. But let patience have a perfect work mm -hmm. that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see that? But he says, let, her, let, her, let patience have her perfect work. Because patience must what? Must work perfection in, your, in terms of your faith. You understand? And that takes time. Perfection is not an overnight uh, program. Okay, Ray? If any of you lack wisdom, let no, him ask of that. God. That's it on that. That's it on that. But you see, verse two and the three and four is letting you know patience is necessary. Because guess what? It's gonna what? It's gonna bring you to perfection because you 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 every day you fight, you fight, you fight. And the 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 best way to be able to what to reach the level of perfection, to increase your faith, to what to strengthen your spirit, that when we fast, you fast often. Okay, that's why weekly we are fasting every Wednesday as a congregation. Why? Because we want to feed our spirits so that the flesh can be weak. So that the flesh is not over, is not powerful, um, is not powerful over what? Over our spirits. Get that in John 4. John chapter 4 and verse 24. Read that. John chapter 4, verse 24. Mm -hmm. God is a spirit. Right. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see that? He says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You cannot worship the most High God in spirit when you are always feeding the flesh. It's not going to happen. If you're always feeding the flesh, that means the spiritual man is starving. So you will not be able to serve him in spirit if you always feed in the flesh. You will not be able to feed him to serve him in truth either because you are always indulging and feeding your flesh. How can you serve him in spirit and in truth? You can't. Watch this. Give me that in John 4. I mean, Luke 4 verse 2. Here's what our Lord and Savior Christ did when he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, watch this. Come on. Luke chapter 4, verse 2. Right. Being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. So now what the devil was doing was tempting Christ while he was what? He was feeding his spirit. So as he was feeding his spirit, the devil kept tempting him because the devil understood if, if his spirit is strong, he's not going to easily what? Be weak to sin. That's the point. Watch this. Get that in John 17, verse 18. John. Excuse me, sir. John 17, verse 18. Come on. 
John chapter 17, verse 18. Mm -hmm. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. You see that the Christ says, as thou hast sent me into the world, because the most I did, it says, even so have I also sent them into the world. He sent us into the world. Okay, go ahead. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, mm -hmm. that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You see that thing? It says, for their sakes. He's talking about us. He says, I sanctify myself. How did he do that when he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights? He says, I sanctify for their sake. I sanctified myself, meaning I prepared myself for the trial, for the sake of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then it says that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So just like he sanctified himself for us, we must sanctify ourselves for our, our nation. That's the same spirit we must roll in. You understand? Get that in Job real quick. Okay. Job 23, verse 12. Job, chapter 23, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You see that? He says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So if you are always feeding the flesh, guess what? You are not going to be able to what? To sanctify yourself for, your, for the sake of your nation. You're not going to be able to serve the Lord in, in spirit and in truth. Because we must what? We have, in order for us to do that, we must what? He says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Meaning the what? The food that you eat to feed your flesh. It says what? We must what? We must focus more on feeding our spirits rather than feeding the flesh. That's what the Lord is saying. You understand? So I'm going to end the class right there. All praises to the most High God. Let's break bread in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. These do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. These do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in the remembrance of me. For as often as eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 